This week, David Horowitz, the editor-in-chief of The Times of Israel, is the JCRC's featured speaker for its June 12th event in Minneapolis. But before he comes to the Twin Cities, Horowitz is on this podcast to talk about Israeli politics, a decade of TOI, and how to report on the Middle East. I'm Lev Gringaus, and welcome to The Jews Are Tired, your podcast about Jewish news. This podcast is supported by the Afternoon School and Midrasha at the Talmud Torah of St. Paul, offering online supplementary Jewish education for students in grades 2 through 12, great Jewish education from any location, now enrolling for fall. Learn more at ttsp.org slash as dash m. And of course, if you like this podcast or Jew folk generally and the work that we do, support us by buying our merch. We've got designs for everything. If you're feeling proud, pick up a 10,000 Ways to be Jewish shirt. Feeling eh? Grab a 10,000 Ways to Disappoint Your Parents mug. And when you're feeling totally done, which is happening a lot nowadays, grab a shirt with the The Jews Are Tired logo on it. A link to the store is in the podcast notes, so go take a look. And there's also a link to donate to Jew Folk in the podcast notes if you want to give directly. We appreciate any support you can give. By the way, as of the release of this podcast, it's day 92 of Russia's war in Ukraine. If you want to donate to help Ukraine, there's a link in the podcast notes with resources to do that. Also, just to take an aside on what I know is really on Americans' minds right now, You'll find a link in the podcast notes to a Jew Folk piece by Izzy Wellman, Jew Folk's social media and marketing strategist, with the headline, Tired of Excuses. It's about the mass shooting this week at an elementary school in Texas. I can't bring myself to really say much about this right now, as um, honestly, I've been kind of finding myself about to burst into tears at any moment, um, anytime I think about the shooting. And every time I read a new update on what happened, which feels kind of weird to say as a guy and as a Russian-speaking Jew is kind of always supposed to be the, you know, no feelings, no nothing masculine type. But it's been, um, you know, trying not to cry in front of family kind of, kind of week. I think I'll let loose on a future podcast episode. I, I do have things to say about this. But for now, is he really captured what I and many others are feeling and specifically the feeling of, of, really complete helplessness that is just ever present as we watch our country and our home fundamentally fail and actively choose to fail to protect human life and dignity. Especially for us, I mean, Izzy and I are both 24 as the generation that has really grown up with this reality. So please go read her article. Okay, let's talk David Horowitz. That's who this podcast is about. Let's get to that. Horowitz is a British-Israeli journalist and the founding editor-in-chief of The Times of Israel, a mainly English news site, generally seen as being center-left, but way more importantly, it has become a source of really serious and great reporting on Israel, the Palestinian territories, the Middle East, and the Jewish world more broadly. Horowitz spent decades at the Jerusalem Post and the Jerusalem Report, serving as editor-in-chief at both publications before starting up The Times of Israel in 2012. And that's basically all the intro for Horowitz I really have to do. I think TOI speaks for itself, and the quality of coverage is really something I rely on all the time to understand what's happening in the world. If you're in the Twin Cities and want to hear Horowitz speak in person, by the way, he will be the featured speaker at the Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota and the Dakotas annual event on June 12th. The event link for that is in the podcast notes. But otherwise, I mean, he's here on this podcast episode, so, you know, stay tuned. But before getting to the interview itself, which I did alongside Lonnie Goldsmith, my editor at TCG Folk and the host of our Who the Folk podcast, there's a little bit of background I do have to give to the content of our conversation. First of all, shortly before we recorded it on May 19th, the Israeli government suffered yet another political crisis of just, oh, so many, too many crises to count. So the government is formed by a coalition of political parties in the 120-seat Knesset, which is Israel's parliament. 
A government coalition needs to have minimum 61 seats to be able to properly function, kind of the obvious, you know, need to have a majority of votes when passing legislation. The current government is also super weird. Uh, a right-wing prime minister, Naftali Bennett, heads a coalition of right-wing to center to far-left political parties, along with an Islamist Arab party. You know, this weirdness came out of Israel's two years and four national elections of political gridlock, which stemmed from the previous longtime prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. If you want to know more about that, go listen to episode 62 of this podcast, where Lonnie and I interviewed Yossi Klein Halevi. The main point here, though, is that, you know, a month ago, a Jewish right-wing member of the government left the coalition, saying it wasn't right-wing enough. That left the government with 60 seats in the Knesset. It previously had the bare minimum of 61. And then, literally, like, hours before this interview with Horowitz was recorded, another member of the government left the coalition, this time an Arab left-winger saying the government was too right-wing. So with 59 Knesset seats, it kind of felt like now the government would finally collapse. So that's where we started the conversation with Horowitz. And funny enough, a few days later, the Arab left-wing member of the Knesset rejoined the government, restabilizing things for now. So this episode is kind of a crash course in trying to make sense of Israeli politics. The second bit of context is that we talked for a bit about prominent Al Jazeera journalist Shireen Abu Akleh, who was shot and killed during an Israeli Defense Force raid on the Palestinian city of Jenin earlier in May. The raid itself was prompted by a series of terror attacks in Israel earlier this year, in which several of the perpetrators were allegedly Palestinians from Jenin. If you want to learn more about those terror attacks, I covered them in episode 74 of this podcast, but Abu Akleh's death has become... I don't want to just like resort to buzzwords like a flashpoint or disputed or whatever, but her death has gotten a lot of attention because Palestinians say that the IDF deliberately killed her. The IDF insisted at first that it was, you know, shooting from Palestinian militants that probably accidentally hit Abu Akleh before conceding that there was a chance that the IDF had accidentally shot her while firing at the Palestinian militants. In some sense, there's no way to know what happened. The Palestinian Authority, which nominally controls Palestinian areas of the West Bank, won't release the bullet that killed Abu Akleh for analysis. The IDF started a probe, but will not do a criminal investigation without further evidence, aka the bullet that the Palestinian Authority has that would probably tell everyone what actually happened. However, reporting from the Associated Press says a review of witness testimony and footage from the scene shows it's more likely than not that it was an IDF soldier who killed Abu Akleh, but whether it was an accident or on purpose isn't clear. At the same time, a CNN investigation has concluded that Israeli soldiers were deliberately targeting Abu Akleh to kill her. You can find links to both reports in the podcast notes. The IDF disputes CNN's findings of deliberate targeting, of course. Abu Akhla's funeral was also a massive disaster, with Israeli police beating pallbearers and mourners, allegedly for throwing stones and for trying to steal Abu Akhla's casket from the family, but her family disputed that police narrative. To read more about that, look to the podcast notes for two columns by David Horowitz about this, which are referenced during our conversation. The Israeli police are kind of known for, honestly, a level of brutality when, when dealing with certain situations. So with all of that, you should be all caught up. Our conversation has been edited for length and clarity. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. My name is Lev Gringaus. I'm the host of the Jews Are Tired podcast. Hi, this is David Horowitz. I'm the editor of the Times of Israel. Uh, on my way to you, but speaking to you from Jerusalem. And I am Lonnie Goldsmith, the editor of TC Jew Folk, and very happy to be a fly on the wall and sort of participant for this conversation. So David, just to start out before getting to anything else, um, I, of course, have to ask, what's your expectation of when Israel's government is going to sort of fully collapse again? And what might happen next? Because it's honestly kind of frustrating. I'm sure it's more frustrating for you and everyone in Israel to see this government end two years and four election cycles of uncertainty, only for some Knesset members to seemingly be ready to plunge Israel back into sort of endless elections for legitimate or not legitimate reasons, that sort of, but, you know, it's, it's sort of interesting how the Whole, how the cookie crumbles, I guess. So what's your perception of what's going on and what's going to happen? 
Okay, well, first of all, we have to make plain that I'm speaking to you on a Thursday early evening on the 19th of May in Jerusalem. And as of three hours ago, I would have answered that question very differently. So uh, any answer I give you um, when you're listening to it a few days from now, bear in mind that this is Israeli politics. Yeah, we had four elections in two years, uh, but we also have hourly political mini crises and weekly political major crises. Uh, so today, a coalition that had 60 uh, supporters in the 120-seat Knesset uh, slipped to 59 supporters when uh, a, a Knesset member from Meretz announced that she was resigning. Um, if, if you thought that arithmetic was everything, that means the coalition's over, right? They've got, a, they've got less votes than the other guys. Um, but it's not so simple, and it could have played out in many ways between uh, me talking and, and people listening to this, including the coalition falling. Um, the Likud-led op led opposition wants to bring down this government. Um, they have uh, a process to do that where they can bring a bill uh, for the dissolution of the Knesset. It only needs a simple majority to pass its first stage, its preliminary vote. After that, though, it needs 61 of the 120. And although those opposed to the coalition now, as I'm speaking to you, do indeed number 61, that doesn't mean they'll all vote with the opposition to bring down the coalition. So, for example, the lawmaker who's just resigned uh, is very critical of the coalition, very unhappy about some of its policies. Uh, that doesn't mean that she necessarily wants to see new elections. Uh, Meretz, her party, actually are um, one of the more um, invested in this coalition, I would say, as a party, more reluctant to see it fall. Um, so it could play out in many, many ways, and indeed could have played out in many, many ways. But at the root of this, and this you know, probably will be relevant uh, a few days from now, is that we have all kinds of instabilities within our political system. We have a very pure um, uh, electoral system. In, in some ways, you might say it's great. It's ultra-democratic. Uh, unlike in the American system or the British system, Almost every vote genuinely counts. We have pure proportional representation. You don't have a constituency or a state where you think, why bother? We know what's going to happen here. It doesn't work like that at all. We just have a threshold. If any party gets more than three and a quarter percent of the votes nationwide, they get their seats in parliament. And therefore, you know, there's a very pure reflection of the voters' will. But at the same time, that makes for lots of small parties in parliament. And then you add to that some of the realities of Israeli politics of late. And, and there's really two that, that are relevant here. One is that Israel has moved to the right in, in a fairly significant way, I would say, in the past two decades since the Second Intifada, since that onslaught of suicide bombers and Palestinian terrorism. Um, and therefore, you know, the right is in the ascendant. And in the current Knesset, the, the, the right, the people who ideologically are very wary of the Palestinians, uh, the ultra-Orthodox parties, um, the parties who are, who are in the orbit of Netanyahu's Likud, they have a clear majority. And therefore, that begs the question, well, then why aren't they running Israel? Why isn't Netanyahu the prime minister? Because at the same time, there is considerable hostility, I think it's, it's fair to say, to Netanyahu in some of the right. Three of the parties in the Bennett-led coalition uh, are led by people who've worked very closely with Netanyahu. Bennett's own Yamina, uh, Avigdor Lieberman's Yisrael Beiteinu, and Gidon Sar's New Hope. These are all people who know Netanyahu intimately, who share much of his political ideology, but thought that the imperative for Israel to oust Netanyahu was stronger than the imperative for Israel to necessarily pursue all of the right-wing ideological policies that they would champion. So you've got this, this curious situation where the right is a majority, but the right isn't solely in power. And all of those factors, and the, just the sheer improbability of this coalition, a coalition all the way from ideological right across the center into the left, merits, you know, the most left-wing Zionist left-wing party, and most unlikely of all, Ra'am, an Islamist Arab party, much of whose leadership and guiding council, I think, is very, very wary about sitting in government, but a party led by one politician, Mansour Abbas, who is extolling the possibilities of greater Arab-Jewish harmony in Israel and has hung in there, even as members of Bennett's party and now members of Meretz or a member of Meretz uh, have resigned and defected. So that's the, <laughs> the shortest, 
coherent answer I can give to your impossible question. So if Netanyahu were to say, I won't run for prime minister, like I'll step aside out of leadership, would that pave the way for Likud to return to the ascendancy in, in a controlling role? I think it's fair to say, although by, ne- by necessity it's speculative, that if Netanyahu in the last election, or even after the last election, when the votes were in, had said, look, I can see that there's so many people who are so hostile to me, I think it's outrageous. But uh, it's more important to me that our, our ideology uh, uh, leads Israel. If he were to have said that, the current coalition would have not have taken shape. It would have been a different coalition, with a different lead, headed by a different leader of Likud, or, or some other uh, um, constellation. Uh, at the moment, again, everyone, I'm not prophesizing, you're listening to this a few days after I said it. At the moment, I think Netanyahu will be thinking that the day is drawing ever nearer when he can return as prime minister at the head of Likud uh, and be vindicated in not having stepped down, in not having said, you know, okay, I won't be prime minister, let, let Likud run the country with someone other than me. Uh, I think he may see that the prospect of that happening is closer than it has been certainly in, in the in the 11 months that this coalition has been in power. Uh, it's not going to be straightforward from where it looks on the 19th of May, but who knows, maybe it'll look a little more straightforward for him by the time we're listening to this. So, uh, Lonnie, that wonderful look on your face of like, this is kind it, of crazy. It, 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 it's just, it's dizzying. Though, like, again, we're talking a week before this is going to drop, and who knows how many different permutations we could see between, you know, in the next seven days between now and then. Yeah, not only that, Lonnie, if you've asked me a day ago to, to ne- name for you the 10 Knesset members who might doom this coalition, uh, the, the one who, who quit today would not have been on my list. And therefore, I promise you, that in, in the inter- intervening period, even if we try to cover all the bases in this conversation, we will be exposed as you know not capable of understanding all the endless potential twists and turns of Israeli politics. Fascinating. So with that window into the absolute utter chaos of the region, um, I want to take kind of a step back as 2022 marks a decade of the existence of Times of Israel, the news organization that you lead. Um, and I kind of wanted to ask, like, how has it been starting TOI and watching it grow to the place it is now, one of the foremost Israeli and Jewish news sites in the world? That's a very kind question. And um, and I'm very proud of it. Um it's kind of a, a mini miracle to, to the, where there was nothing. There's now this very resonant uh, journalistic outlet that uh, that tries to do responsible journalism that doesn't always get everything right, but tries to correct it if it gets it wrong. Uh, that is independent. We're not in thrall to any party or uh, any particular um, leader on the Israeli political spectrum or anywhere else. Um, I have a partner who has... Um, financially uh, um, supported what we do uh, as the business um, becomes more viable as a business. Not a, not an easy thing to do. Uh, but the editorial operation here is independent. People find that hard to believe because it's so atypical, but it truly is. In, in as far as we have biases and and, and, and faults. There are there are our own faults, not, not biases imposed upon us. And I think that's incredibly important. You know, I think I think Israel um, benefits from a a website such as ours, which tries to tell people what's going on in a fair-minded fashion and then has this incredibly vibrant blogs platform with a a range of opinions, uh, including some of yours, Lev. Uh, as I noticed before oh, I go on this call. God, no, please, no, wait. I Sorry, now that you have to mention it, I have to tell listeners to never, ever look up any of my blogs because I was like a stupid 20-year-old writing about how I fell in love with an Israeli at camp. None of it is worthwhile. So I, I, I kind of hate that you brought that up, but it's very funny that you did. Anyway, sorry, keep going. <laughs> Yeah, but you have editing power over this podcast, Lev, so we may never hear it. Oh, no, it's uh, definitely it's airing. You said it, <laughs> it has to air. Yeah. yeah, it has so to. So anyway, you know, that, that you know, very, very wide mix of, of, of ideas and, and opinions, it's, it's a good combination. It's obviously proved very resonant with people. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I do think people appreciate it. This is a very difficult period for journalism, uh, economically, and also in terms of, of the importance people attach to it. And by the way, this, the simple challenge of, of, of journalism in the internet era, right, where if you're not fast, you, you risk being irrelevant. And if you're uh, too fast, you risk being inaccurate. Uh, 
and and finding the balance. Um, I mean, it's an impossible balance, uh, but doing your best to be both um, relevant and therefore relatively fast um, and accurate, uh, that's a huge challenge. There's another challenge in that we're a 24-7 site and we're a 24-7 site whose um, headquarters and, and the base of, of almost all, but not all, almost all of our journalists is Israel. We're covering Israel and the Middle East and the Jewish world. We're covering it. I mean, we have foreign language sites. We have versions of the site in French and in Hebrew uh, and in Arabic and in Farsi. Uh, but an awful lot of our readership, probably half our readership, maybe a little more, is in North America. So as we're getting exhausted towards the end of every day at, say, midnight Israel time, four for you guys, and it's five for New York, correct? So yes. you're still in the, you know, the, 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 not the middle, but, you know, in, in the work day. LA, of course, is, you know, uh, just getting past lunch. And, and we're all exhausted and it never ends. So that 24-7 endlessness of it uh, is incredibly challenging for everyone who works here. Um, and, um, but you know, we, we do the, we do the best we can and it's extremely gratifying to see how resonant the site is, how much traffic there is. And also that, that people read, um, a lot of people read the things that we want them to read as well as the things we know that they would read. (laughs) So, you know, to digress beyond the question you asked me, um, there are issues that are, that are in the niche of what we cover, Israel, the Jewish world, the Middle East. And then there are issues that just leap the niche, jump the niche, right? Uh, anything we write about archaeology, um, 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 household pets, um, uh, anything that touches on sex, I have to tell you, in the spirit of candor, um, resonates more than some of the things that are very limited to, to the particular interest of the specific readers who come to us all the time. We had a story a few years ago about an exhibition at the Israel Museum of um, alabaster. Uh, wall plaster work from ancient Iraq showing sexual congress between household pets. I promise you I'm not making that up. Um, so, <laughs> as you would gather from the beginning of that answer, that was a very resonant and, and extremely high-minded, I have to say, but a very resonant article. You got all the topics in there in one. Archaeology, pets, and sex, all in one uh, headline. That was, that was the, yes, the, tri, the trifecta, is that what it's called? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But okay, so outside of that, though, through this this decade, what do you think the most important story that either you directly or, or Times of Israel in general has uh, has covered? Well, that's a really good question, uh, and I'm, I don't know if I can pin a, pin that down to a single story. I mean, there are lots of things that are very important. Um, you know, the, the the advance of the Iranian nuclear program and all of the ups and downs around efforts to stop it is incredibly important from a Israel-centered point of view. This is a regime that is so hostile to Israel. Um, the Iranian public does not share that hostility as far as we can tell. It's quite extraordinary, but the regime is hostile and you have to take it seriously. Obviously, all of the chaos that we discussed already in Israeli politics, which is which we've talked about lightly, but instability in government uh, is, is extremely damaging. The challenges to democracy, I suppose, that's the big theme. Uh, in Israel, uh, around the free world. And that comes into to journalism and journalism having such a difficult economic time of it now. So, the, you know, that combination of being part of a profession that I think is noble um, when it's done properly. I think, you know, democracies rely on independent journalism to make sure that the people that we choose to uh, run our, our macro lives for us uh, do so honorably and do so in, in the spirit with which, you know, we, we chose them. That the difficulties in, in being able to do that work um, because of financial uh, considerations and then the difficulties of getting at the truth. And I don't think, I mean, you're asking about Israel and the Times of Israel for 10 years, but I think that's, you know, that's the big story for journalism and therefore for journalism's role in democracy. You know, are journalists able to do their job effectively and independently? Are readers interested in, in getting at the truth? Uh, the, you know, this notion that there isn't one truth. I mean, there, are, there is a truth. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can always capture it effectively, but to strive for objectivity and fair-mindedness and truth, I think, is, is, has been the big challenge. And I also think, you know, you guys are... are, are uh, uh, considerably younger than I am. Uh, I think this is a difficult period. I, don't, I think my generation-ish, kind of generalizing widely, had it relatively easy in terms of in terms of where humanity was headed and and 
and the values that were being championed and advanced and so on. Uh, I don't think uh, the generation before mine uh, had it anywhere near as easy, of course, if you think of that generation as being the World War II generation. Um, and I think your generation is having it harder. It's having it harder economically, I think psychologically. It's a very difficult period. I'm not making comparisons between you know, who had it worse and so on. But I think, uh, I think this is a pretty challenging period. I'm glad you make me feel so good about myself. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're young and that's, you know, that's a huge advantage. So you know, enjoy that. Thank you. Although I am, I, I am considerably older than Lev, so I, you know, so I, you know, you mentioned something you mentioned about Times of Israel in terms of the, the risk of being, you know, fastest is getting it wrong and taking your time is being last in reporting something. And I come from, you know, a world of, you know, newspaper reporting, not totally pre-internet, but close, and certainly pre-social media. So, you know, there wasn't the same kind of race to be first, it was the race to be correct. And now I think it, it it's in a very different place journalistically. Yeah, so I, I think that's right. And I think, I mean, one of the ways we've tried to tackle it is we've we we've grown the staff. We have more editors, we have more people working um, because we would like to be um, fairly speedy uh, and we would like to be accurate. I mean, what, what's, what's been playing out today in Israeli politics, when a, a, a resignation from the coalition was, was um, first announced, the initial assumption was, well, that's the end of the coalition. As I speak to you now, it's not clear to me whether all the, as I said before, whether all the people no longer in the coalition will vote against it. Uh, that, you know, that things are evolving in a way that journalism couldn't cover, you know, 10 and 20 years ago, right? I, you know, I, I said at uh, uh, the Jerusalem Post until 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, and, and it's still the case with print newspapers, at the end of the day, when the, when the first edition or the only edition has to go to the press, that's the end of the story for that day's print edition. Uh, that remains the case. And that print edition, you want to make as, as accurate as you possibly can. And you know by definition, and your readers know by definition, that when they're picking it up in the morning, yeah, that closed six, eight, ten hours ago. And it's not going to be, and they're going to be checking stuff online. And we know this. All of these you know, phenomena are, are, are obvious to everybody. But, um, you know, the challenges that we face in journalism are a function of, of that incredible capacity to communicate incredibly fast to everybody. You know, everything you put out there is available, including your blogs, for example, Lev, right? That's the point. And, and that, you know, br that brings tremendous responsibility. And if you want to be a cre credible journalistic outlet, uh, outlet, you know, that does impose a, a, a great responsibility. It's very easy to be resonant and sensationalist and frequently wrong. Uh, and you can get a lot of traffic with very sensationalist material, right or wrong. If, if you want to be responsible, if you want to be a force that enables people to understand, and again, we are not perfect, but we try it. We try to get it right, and we try to um, minimize the costs of, of, of needing to be fairly accurate. It's very challenging. Of, of needing to be fairly fast. It's very, very challenging. So to ask you a question that sort of hits at the intersection of a lot of these different sort of issues that you're talking about journalistically. You wrote a couple of great pieces last week, uh, the first-hand account of slain Al Jazeera journalist Shirin Abu Akhla's funeral march, and another critical, another piece critical of the police for its behavior in the incident, others in sort of, in general, about police behavior. So we're curious to ask you, what type of pushback do you get when you publish pieces that may either come off as or be outright critical of Israeli authorities, because Israel, of course, has freedom of speech, but there's also a military censor and sort of a different culture around that. So what do you run into? What are your concerns when, when printing stuff like that? Or printing, I guess, in air quotes. Yeah, okay. I mean, military censorship is not a factor there. Military censorship, broadly speaking, uh, uh, is, is a gentleman's agreement, or uh, I don't know how you would, you would uh, more properly define that in this era. But it's, a, it's an agreement that only works if uh, both, if journalists are prepared to recognize uh, why material is being is, is is asked to be submitted for censorship or is being censored. Uh, and it's been, um, and by the way, the Israeli courts will intervene. You can go to court if you think material is being censored for some reason. Censorship, you know, it usually uh, relates to something terrible has happened and the family hasn't been told yet. Uh, or um, given that Israel is a pretty small country on the western edge of a, a largely, not completely hostile um, uh, landmass, um, and you, you know, if you were to, to, to want to write an article detailing the specifics of Israel's military deployments and so on, uh, you might have a battle with the censor. It doesn't, it's not a factor in, in, in 
in almost any conceivable opinion piece that one would write, uh, unless, you know, your opinion piece is lapsed into those areas where there would be some legitimate uh, um, potential reason for military censorship. But, you know, nothing I write, almost nothing I write, um, certainly not in an opinion piece, uh, would, would be submitted for censorship. And it's very unlikely that that, that would be a factor, right? Um, in terms of other responses, I mean, I don't think they're any different to anywhere else in the world, right? We're, we're out there online and people can comment and um, people do comment and they comment across the spectrum. Uh, in terms of the times of Israel, you know, we're perceived to be, remember, left and right in Israel are not, are not always the same as they would be in the States. They're not, they're they, you know, they are to some extent socioeconomic, but they're more... Uh, factors of ideology when it comes to uh, the Palestinians, especially in Israel's place in the region and so on, right? Um, so there are plenty of people who think that the Times of Israel is very left-wing and there are plenty of people who think that the Times of Israel is, is, is uh, very right-wing. And I would say that's a necessary but not sufficient uh, condition for a website that's actually trying to be fair-minded. Uh, and the same applies when, when I write something. I might, you know, might, you, you get criticism from, from all, all parts of the spectrum. Uh, criticisms that I would think are, are some, ca some cases entirely spot on and other cases, you know, wildly misdirected and suggest that the person has fired off the criticism without actually reading the article. But you have to write what you feel is right. Um, you know, I don't ignore um, criticism. I really don't. Uh, I take it and I, and I think about it. Um, and it, you know, like all of the sources of information and, and, uh, uh, opinion that filter into our worldviews, you know, you, your views are, 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 are moved and circumstances change and so on. But broadly speaking, uh, I write what I think is fair. So the, the couple of pieces that you mentioned, uh, I didn't, I wasn't at the part of the funeral where, uh, outside the hospital, where uh, police um, attacked uh, mourners, including people carrying the casket. Uh, at, at an early stage of the funeral inside uh, Jerusalem. Um, I was at the uh, subsequent part of the procession, which was just inside Jaffa Gate, and I wrote what I saw. Um, and that's, you know, that's what that piece was. It was I, I described it as a sort of reporter's notebook. It was less an opinion piece than a, here's what played out, where I saw it, and, and what we could understand from it. And the, the second piece you mentioned which uh, was certainly critical of the police's handling of the funeral, the policy that guided uh, what went on that day. Um, I, I wanted to take care in that piece to stress how hard the, the work of the police is. Um, and I talked about all the other uh, responsibilities and, and, uh, and, and, and work that they do, without which this would be an untenable reality in Israel. You know, they, they're trying to prevent terrorism. Uh, they're trying to crack down on crime. Uh, it's not a simple uh, job being an, a police officer in this country. They're also under, underfunded and understaffed. You know, those are not uh, um, insignificant issues. So even in a piece where I felt that the, the really the policy, most of all, of how that funeral was handled, the notion um, that, you know, it, I would have thought that intervening would have been an, a, a real last resort given all the sensitivity surrounding that funeral. And yet it seemed that uh, intervention was almost um, a necessity if what, what we understand is accurate about the orders that the cops were given. Uh, and that I think, I, I think the policy was misguided at the very top. Uh, I tried to write that and I tried to write it in a context that was not just heaping criticism on a, on a police force that, that ha has this vital uh, role. So the the circumstances around Shireen's um, shooting are are still rather mysterious. I don't necessarily know if we're ever going to know who's responsible for that. And I suppose, given that context, does that concern you? You know, either for yourself in the field or your Times of Israel colleagues when you're out reporting in the middle of something that might be a little, you know, spicier than usual. Uh, that's a that's a very good question. And you know, again, because there's there's uh, um, there's there's a time lapse between when I'm saying this and when you're hearing it. I don't know if we're going to know definitively. Uh, it seems to me that the Israeli um, army's investigation is making progress. Um, they've, you know, as of several days ago already had, had they think, pinned this down. 
to two possible um, moments during what was an IDF uh, operation in Janine, uh, a, a series of escalated IDF operations because there'd been a stream of terrorist attacks, many of them, several of them, carried out by people from the Janine area. Uh, and Shireen uh, Abu Akhle was uh, some distance from um, certainly parts of, of where the gunfire was exchanged, as far as we can tell. The one thing I, I think we, you know, I, I would say uh, as definitively as one dare say, is I don't think she was deliberately targeted. Uh, and, and that's worth saying because the Palestinian Authority, never mind Hamas, has said that Israel executed her. And I've even seen headlines and assertions in um, Western media uh, where that has been uh, asserted or alleged. Uh, I don't think she was deliberately targeted. I don't think she was deliberately targeted, whether it was uh, indiscriminate Palestinian gunfire or an Israeli shot that missed its intended Palestinian gunman target. Uh, in neither of those cases, from what I understand of, of, uh, of what's been uh, identified. By the way, including I've seen material from uh, open source people abroad trying to get to the bottom of this. Uh, so I, I think that's very important to say. It was uh, errant gunfire um, that, that killed her. And that really brings me to the essence of your question, because it underlines that um, this, uh, this was a very experienced reporter who... I do not think for a moment was interested in placing herself in the line of fire or in danger, quite the reverse, uh, and yet she was killed. So it, it highlights the, the dangers. I mean, you know, you know, life is potentially dangerous at any moment, as we all know, right? But you try to minimize the dangers. Now, in, in journalism, some journalists are prepared to take greater risks, calculated risks, than people who are not uh, doing this profession, uh, and then, and then some other people in this profession. You know, we we try to ensure that our reporters are out of harm's way. I do not want people to to take unnecessary risks uh, in order to do their job. In fact, I, I, you know, when we've talked about when we have, we've had people in in Ukraine in recent weeks and months, where do we send people? Where, you know, there there is nowhere that is without risk. Where do you send people that is, that is responsible? And these are things that uh, editors and people responsible for journalists and journalists themselves, uh, these are issues they grapple with in, in almost every context. I can tell you a good many years ago, somebody approached me about going to Iran to cover uh, an election. And I was incredibly wary about sending someone to Iran simply because if you're writing for an Israeli outlet from Iran, uh, you know, that's, that's, a, that's real danger. And there were lots of, there's lots of back and forth and it was, it was quite complicated. Uh, in the end, this person did go to Iran, and, and it was not a foolhardy thing for that person to have done, and nothing bad happened. But, you know, again, that underlines, in there, there are circumstances where, where it's obvious that there are real risks, and the, the, the trouble starts in circumstances where the risk was not obvious, where you have been prudent, where, you've, where you think you have placed yourself uh, in a location where you can do your job responsibly, your important job, as, as I've said already, um, without uh, undue risk, but of course there are, you know there are no absolute defenses. And just and just one more thing on this point: in an Israel and and in other parts of the world where where people have had to deal with so much terrorism, it's it's not just journalism. Um, in, in the Second Intifada, and I've written about this, Israelis became basically domestic security consultants. Everybody was weighing what is an undue risk. You know, is it safe to take the buses? Is it safe to, to go shopping in Machane Yehuda? Uh, and, and there are no absolute answers to those questions. There is threat assessment, risk assessment. Um, so Israelis do it. Uh, lots of people in lots of places all around the world do it. Um, and, and it used to be that you'd speak to, to, to visiting groups about terrorism and you were describing things that were not familiar to them. The, the tragedy of recent years, not just the last few years, but recent years, is that the notion of calculating your risks in the face of semi-arbitrary terrorism is not unfamiliar to lots and lots of people nowadays around the world. So to get into some hopefully juicy Israel diaspora stuff, what do you consider the greatest threat to Israel? And what's the role of diaspora Jewry in helping Israel either avoid or fight back against that? 
Okay, again, it's a, it's a good question. And, you know, I, I talked about the greatest, you know, potential military threat, which is the Iranian nuclear program and, and Iran's, you know, state championing of, of forces that seek Israel's elimination, some of which are now directly on Israel's borders. I'm thinking, of course, of Hezbollah, which is an Iranian tool, and, and Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza and so on. But I, you know, I, I have immense faith in Israel's um, military capabilities and its national resilience, which kind of brings me to, to the answer that, that I would give to your question, which is that the, I think the biggest danger to Israel is the danger that has doomed ancient efforts to maintain Jewish sovereignty in our historic homeland, which is internal division and hatred. And, um, you know, we've come very close to the brink uh, in Israel. We, we assassinated our own prime minister uh, a little over a quarter of a century ago. And I think we kind of pulled black, pulled back after that. Uh, but, but that disunity and that internal um, nastiness is an understatement, uh, is a real threat. And it's internal intolerance, really. And, and ironically, even though I think Israel and diaspora, you know, they have, um, they, they've gone to some extent in different ways in that Israel has been around now for almost a quarter of a century and people made their choices. You know, pe people have, have chosen to, to come and live in Israel. People have chosen to support Israel from outside in the Jewish diaspora. And there are many Jews who, who, are, who are very disconnected to Israel. Of course, you know, lots of establishment Jew Jewry and lots of individual Jews incredibly invested and connected to Israel. What I think is striking, I think for Israelis, often when they go to diaspora communities is the internal tolerance I mean, we can be so nasty to each other as Jews in Israel uh, to a degree that Jewish communities around the world would, would consider unthinkable. Oh, my goodness. And there's, there seems to me to be an easier internal Jewish harmony, despite differences between the streams of Judaism and so on. Uh, there's, there's, there's a greater harmony and a greater awareness that so much more connects us than divides us uh, in, in diaspora Jewry than there is in Israel. Because maybe because we're the majority here, you know, we, we allow ourselves to think we can be not we can afford to be nasty to nastier to each other and more intolerant of each other. So, you know, I think broadly speaking, Israel has to make its own decisions about issues of national security and, and the, the big things that shape our capacity uh, to survive and flourish here. But I think we need all the input that we can get, first of all, as as in terms of dialogue on everything, uh, not in terms of prescriptive material from the diaspora. But in terms of internal Jewish capacity to work well together and, and find um, compromises and harmony, uh, there I think we have a lot to learn from the diaspora. And that's central to our capacity to, to be resilient and to, and to be sufficiently unified uh, to face down the threats, the, the, the more conventional threats that we face. So uh, on, on the sort of note of nastiness, I know this is maybe a point to un unpack further for listeners in a later episode, but I do just want to say something I think about occasionally is the fact that when I lived in Israel, uh, as a sort of more secular person, I've never been more swept up in hatred of other Jews than when I lived in Israel, particularly towards Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, who were, for example, beating up my friends at the Western Wall when they were going there with women of the wall. And it's really amazing to sort of step back. And I've never felt that kind of hatred when living in America or sort of seeing any other Jewish community. It's kind of amazing and awful how that becomes so present in Israel. But the the last question I actually have for you is, a, is sort of sideways to that kind of a tangent, a little bit weird and wonky, but also a really constant issue. You know, I know many of us face and I face as both a consumer and a producer of news, the issue of media bias when it comes to Israel. And this is obviously a convoluted subject. Pro-Israel people often say the news sort of writ large mainstream media is anti-Israel. Pro-Palestinian people often say the news is pro-Israel. I don't actually want to get into sort of what is and isn't media bias. What I want to ask you instead is what to you is the best way to report on Israel and Palestinians and legitimately balance the oftentimes really conflicting views on what is or should be the truth about what happens in the region? How do you report authentically on sort of all the complexities you have to dig through? Okay, so I don't have, um, you know, magical answers to, to a question as complicated as that, but, and I'm not sure I have anything hugely fresh to say, but, uh, you know, journalists do better when they see stuff for themselves. 
um, the more that you're out there um, and and you have the, you know, I, I, I feel the same about, about consumers of information about Israel. Um, there's no real substitute for being in Israel and seeing stuff for yourself. That doesn't mean you, you go to every focus of conflict, but, you know, people who've been to Israel, you know, you, you allow yourselves, yourself, Lev, to talk about uh, something that you saw in Israel because you saw it. You know, it, there's a bigger picture there for sure. But but you you know what you saw. I would I would say in you know in in I would add to what you what you said about um, hatred manifested in in the area of the Western Wall. It's not only a, a one way street. You know, there's incredible um, non ultra orthodox wariness and some acute intolerance um, of non ultra orthodox Israelis towards the ultra orthodox. It's there's there's a great deal of complexity to that picture. There's resentment that uh, many ultra-Orthodox um, youngsters do not serve in the military. Um, there's resentment at the capacity for the two ultra-Orthodox parties in, in the Knesset to um, obtain uh, concessions or, or things for their community that might be disproportionate because of their political power. It's not the case with the current coalition, but it has been for most Israeli coalitions. Um, you know, there, you know, and there's all sorts of issues in both directions there. You know, I, I personally am um, extremely troubled at the ultra-Orthodox monopoly over life cycle uh, events in Israel. Uh, you basically can't be born, married, divorced, or, or dead in this country without the approval of the rabbinate, which is increasingly an ultra-Orthodox uh, entity. But it's an incredibly complicated issue. And the more you know, the, the smarter you can be as journalists in reporting it and as and as people who care about Israel in understanding it. So the, the key thing is, is seeing stuff for yourself as much as possible and knowing as much as you can, right? Which, uh, you know, I always encourage people to, to read widely when, when groups come to Israel. You know, and, and, and by the way, I think this is really important for me to say, it's, it's my belief that the more you understand Israel, really understand it, uh, the more likely you are to empathize with it in a nuanced way. Uh, I don't think that spending a lot of time in Israel open-mindedly and seeing stuff and speaking to a wide range of people and going into the West Bank and the biblical Judean Samaria and visiting settlements and speaking to Palestinians, um, I don't think it's safe to go into Gaza, but in, a, in, in theory, being able to understand what's going on. I think at the end of that, if you've really entered open-mindedly and, and asked questions without preconceptions and listened closely and you formed a wider view. I don't think that needs to make you anti-Palestinian. Uh, I do think it would give you considerable empathy for Israel and the challenges that it faces. I, I, I met with a group a few years ago now um, who had been brought here by the South African Zionist Federation. It was the first time they brought such a group and it was people from academia and journalism and uh, politics who'd been very active in the anti-apartheid movement. Uh, and therefore, it was risky for the South African Zionist Federation to bring a group like that to Israel because there is a narrative, and it is quite resonant in South Africa, that asserts, unfairly in my opinion, um, that Israel is um, some kind of apartheid state. And I met this group at, at the very end of their trip. And broadly speaking, I would say to you that they were so empathetic to Israel that I worried for their credibility when they went home. And I asked them, well, but you met, you did go into the territories and you visited settlements and you spoke to Palestinian officials and they told me everything that they had done and they'd done all of those things. They had had a, a, a genuinely diverse itinerary and they were, I can only say, to put it mildly, they were not hostile to Israel. Smart people who had some co context, who had room to make comparisons and draw parallels, uh, ended a, a, lot, a, a fairly lengthy, sophisticated, diverse trip to Israel and the territories, broadly speaking, empathetic to Israel. Um, so it happens to be, in my opinion, that if you do, if you do understand this country properly, and, and, and that's what we try to do. You know, we're, we're, it's the Times of Israel, for goodness sake, that it, we couldn't be clearer that we are a, an entity that, that, that wants this country to thrive. Uh, I want Israel to thrive as a Jewish and a democratic state. And there's complexity in that statement, as you know, believe me. Uh, but we try to report it fairly. Um, and, you know, other, other media, you know, you, you phrased your question very nicely. You didn't even ask me to respond. 
Um, I don't think you can generalize. I think there are media outlets and there are journalists who do Israel a disservice and others who do not. Uh, I think I think it's, you know, you, you didn't ask me to generalize. I'm not going to generalize, but I, I, I hope I've given you my sense of of, of, of how to get at, uh, at, at, at the essence of what's fair about Israel. Amazing. So just to sort of wrap up, uh, first of all, thank you, David, for, of course, taking time to, to speak with us. Um, you're going to be the featured speaker at the JCRC annual event on Sunday, June 12th. And for listeners, and this will also be in the intro, a link to... Uh, to the JCRC page for that event will be in the podcast notes. So if you want to go and sign up and, and see what that's about, you can do that. This has been this week's The Jews Are Tired podcast. I'm Lev Gringaus. Don't forget to subscribe and share. And hopefully next week, the Jews will get some rest. The Jews Are Tired is a product of Jewfolk Inc. For more information, go to tcjewfolk.com or email the show at podcast at tcjewfolk.com. A link to the transcript of this episode is available in the podcast notes, along with links to any news, stories, or reports referenced for this episode.